Welcome to The Savvy Investor, where it's our job to help you be secure in any economy. You know, for most investors, we've spent years systematically investing in mutual funds, either through our retirement plans, our IRAs, or even our brokerage accounts. Today, we're gonna to talk about finding a better mousetrap. Welcome to The Savvy Investor. Each week, The Savvy Investor helps viewers just like you create and grow wealth, protect and preserve it, and distribute it in the most tax-efficient manner, while alive and after you passed. Our goal is to make you a better informed investor that hopefully leads to better results, but certainly less risk along the way. You can have financial security in any economy. Today is the day you can take control of your financial future and eliminate worry about your retirement forever. And now, The Savvy Investor, with your host, Michael Kinnett. Every day we see mutual fund commercials on television espousing the virtues of long-term investing, and more importantly, long-term investing in mutual funds. It's big business, and the mutual fund industry manages over $32 trillion in assets. Now you think about that, that is a huge number. We invest in mutual funds through our 401ks and 403bs at work. We invest in them directly with the likes of Vanguard, T. Rowe Price, Fidelity, American Funds, even PIMCO. We buy them through our brokerage accounts with companies like Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Prime Capital, and Edward Jones. There are over 8,000 mutual funds to choose among, and every day we see commercials telling us to invest, invest, invest. Now this is big business, and these mutual funds charge us sometimes very hefty fees. Sometimes you see them, sometimes you don't. Today we're going to talk about the pros and cons of owning mutual funds and whether there's a better approach. Before we go explore a better mousetrap, let's take a look at mutual fund news. From the Wall Street Journal, we have a great piece on the hidden cost of mutual funds. And what they're talking about here is that portfolio managers can rack up steep expenses by buying and selling securities. But the fact is, those numbers and expenses aren't reflected in the standard expense ratio. So the question is, how much does it actually cost you to own a mutual fund? And according to the Wall Street Journal, it's 1.41% for management fees. But that's not all, because there are trading costs in there, which according to the Wall Street Journal, average about another 1.8%. Plus, remember that little green line that you see in the commercials? That's called a 12B1 fee, and that's another quarter of a point. So altogether, according to this Wall Street Journal article, we're really talking about somewhere between one and a half to 3% to own that mutual fund. And the question I have is, do you see that in the prospectus? And the answer is no, and we'll look at that later. Now, here's another great piece from uh, US News, and they're talking about index funds still beat most managers. And this is what you're thinking about. This is the whole thing. In order for you to determine whether your mutual fund manager has done a good job or not, he tells you to go look at some indice, be it the S&P or the Dow or the NASDAQ, and he says, measure me against them. And think about this, 75 to 80% of the time, that manager underperforms the indice that he measures himself against. Now, why is that? Aren't we paying this manager to make smart money choices for us? And this holds true regardless if it's equities or bond funds. So today, we're gonna to take a look at how mutual funds work. We're gonna dig down into the specifics of what you need to know about your mutual fund portfolio. And then we're gonna explore what we here at The Savvy Investor call a better mousetrap. You're watching The Savvy Investor, and we'll be right back. If you're in retirement or retiring in the next three to five years, you must read Michael Kinnett's best-selling book, Surviving the Perfect Storm. Best-selling author and National Quill Award winner, Michael Kinnett's Surviving the Perfect Storm is a must-read to prepare for your golden years. This amazing book can be yours absolutely free, but you must call 800-787-SAVVY. Supplies are limited, so be one of the first 25 callers to receive your free limited edition autograph copy of Surviving the Perfect Storm. Call 800 787 Savvy. Welcome back to The Savvy Investor. Today we're exploring the world of mutual funds, how they work, why they work, and should you still be using them? We know that mutual funds are big business, and we see their commercials every day. Everybody from Vanguard to Fidelity and Oppenheimer, we know that brokerage firms love selling them to us. Ameriprises use Tommy Lee Jones to tell us to buy from them. Fidelity has that little green arrow going back and forth, and I absolutely love that little kid in the crib every day trading through Ameritrade. With over $30 trillion, somebody's making a lot of money, and I suspect that over the last decade, it hasn't been you. So what is it exactly about these mutual funds that have so many people putting trillions of dollars into them? Today, we're joined by Matt Forster. He is the Chief Investment Officer of Creative Financial Group.
Matt, welcome to The Savvy Investor. How Thank are you, you doing? Good to be here. So, you know, we're talking about mutual funds today, and the reason why I brought Matt on is, you know, Matt's been dealing with uh, uh, what I call a better mousetrap for a long time. Before we get into exchange-traded funds, I want a little bit of history of, the, of mutual funds. Where'd they come from? You know, some of the pros and cons of working with them. Sure. Well, mutual funds have been around for a long time. They're really a reaction to the Great Depression and some of the regulatory changes that came out of the Great Depression. Um, and they really make it easier for a lot of Americans to invest in portions of the stock and bond markets in the United States. And they, they became huge in the, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, they've been incredibly successful. I mean, if you think about it, in, in just in the U.S., you gave a figure for global mutual fund assets. But in the U.S., they've grown from something like $3 trillion to about $15 trillion today, uh, you know, from 1995. That's a gigantic change. Uh, and they've really been gaining portions of, the, of investment share for a long time. So right now, about half of U.S. households, if there's 100 million U.S. households, about 50 million of them have investments in mutual funds today. It's become a gigantic industry. So let's talk a little bit about how mutual funds work. You know, I always describe them to clients as, as they're like a big basket with, with stocks and or bonds in them. Correct. But let's yeah. talk a little bit about the, the nuances about how the stocks and bonds get chosen, um, some of the implications of that, well, uh, the buying right. and selling of those. Um, it's a complicated industry, but generally most mutual funds are simply a commingled trust so that many different underlying investors own pieces of a trust that owns the stocks or bonds. So, so everybody owns a piece of this big basket. Every owns, everybody owns a slice of this gigantic basket, okay. right? So, you know, and they all have, you know, a management fee. It's so important for everybody to read these prospectus and understand what fees and expenses they're getting charged for owning these. So we're paying a manager to run the fee. Paying the a the manager to run the program. And right? his job run is the, to? His job can be, it can be to match an index. His job can be to out, try to outperform an index. That's the difference between passive management and active management. But he's the one making decisions to buy and sell all the stocks and bonds or whatever's in the, exactly. the portfolio. Exactly. He's the guy that's trying to control what goes into that trust that everybody owns these pieces of. And those are those fees that we were alluding to before. That's that right. we're paying them. Right. But now when he's buying and selling, that, that's what creates those transaction costs, right? That's correct. That's correct. And, and then what are the tax implications of owning a mutual fund? Well, the tax implications are usually that when people buy and sell, if that manager is doing his job, he's creating a capital gain. For beha on behalf of the shareholders of the trust. Oh, you make it sound so nice. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm giving you this, this tax bill. Or, so, or a capital loss. So, I mean, if he's got a capital loss, you can just offset the capital gains inside of the portfolio. But now, the, what ends up happening here is when he's buying and selling, he's buying and selling regardless if you personally want to buy and sell. Correct. And so that tax bill we're talking about is really, it's inflicted on you regardless of whether you buy or sell yourself. Uh, that's exactly right. And, and that's, that's one of the problems I have with mutual funds is that um, costly to own, because that management fee, the transaction cost, um, you know, we talked about that 12B1 fee. Right. I don't like the tax, the taxability of them. Now, of course, you know, we're talking about mutual funds that are in non-qualified accounts, not IRAs. Now, now, but what about, what about the, um, the ability to sell them during the day? I mean, one of the features that I like about exchange-traded funds, we're going to talk about that. But, you know, for investors, you know, I mean, unless you have some special deal, and most of the mutual funds companies got in trouble for this back in the 90s, you can't sell these things until 4 o'clock. Exactly. There's a 4 o'clock. It's the only business. Imagine if you went to a car dealership and you said, I'd like to have a blue car. Great. I'll tell you the price at 4 o'clock. It's an unusual business in that sense that it doesn't price. You're not in control necessarily of the transaction price that you're going to pay when you transact in the fund. Now, we've talked about this off air before. You know, why do mutual fund managers typically underperform the indice that they're measured against? Why is that? Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons why. They just hasn't been very good at it. So if you look at, you know, the history of large cap, you know, U.S. mutual funds over the last 10 years, this is at the end of 2012, about 60% of large cap U.S. managers got beaten by the index. Right. So the question is, why don't you just own the index? Right, which, is, which always begs that question. Why would, why would you pay a manager a fee that incorporates transaction costs, that incorporates tax bills right. when they underperform the indices? and you could just go buy the index fund, which is to some extent why John Bogle always advocates just buy index funds. Right. This is just a cheaper way to do it. Now, you know, I am super hypercritical of mutual funds. I, I've, I've, I've been a critic of them for a long time. Um, and I remember a story, I had a, a client come in that we were talking with about should he move his portfolio over to our management firm? And um, we were talking about the investment vehicles we were using. And, and he said, okay, I talked to my, my prior advisor, the people, you know, people I'm thinking about leaving, and they said to me, yeah, he's using those newfangled 
uh, exchange traded funds. And I right. want to talk about them because, you know, you pointed out that they really are a technological advancement. Um, everything moves forward over generations, sure. and this is a phenomenal advance, advancement for, for investors. Um, before we go there and we, before we delve into that, let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, even though I'm critical about them, there are some times when a mutual fund is the right tool because lots of Americans, you know, it's not one size fits all. It's not one tool is the right tool for everybody. Sometimes a mutual fund is the right tool for people to use. Let's talk a little bit about that. Right. Well, the one fee that you typically don't get in a mutual fund is a commission. So if you're investing $25, $50, $100, $200 uh, a month or a week into a mutual fund, well, if you don't have to pay a commission, it's a better economic transaction for you. you know, but you have to remember that when you own the mutual fund, you have to look at the whole suite of, of fees that they charge, like during expense ratio, the 12B1 fees that you mentioned earlier, as well as a back-end loan, front-end loads. The funds always have different types of conversion features. So you have to look at the whole feature set of the investment that you're making in a mutual fund when you decide to transact in it. So, so of course, you know, what we're talking about here is that if you're making a, a monthly contribution, whether it's to an IRA or 401k or, you know, whatever your retirement account, the TSP 403B, whatever your retirement account is, those type of accounts typically, uh, a company-sponsored account, typically all you have a choice of is mutual funds of some sort. Correct. So, so yeah. you're kind of forced to do that. But for the average American that's trying to put away a little bit extra into their accounts, um, mutual funds might be appropriate just because um, it's, it may be a little bit cheaper way to do it in the short term. Right. Because you're not paying right. that, you know, that ten dollar, twenty dollar ticket charge every time you make a transaction. Right. You pointed out some important things that, and this is true of any type of investment vehicle, you want to understand the pros and cons of using them. And that's everything from what are the transaction costs, what are the fees. Because some mutual funds, you know, we're kind of taking it from the point of view that you're buying a mutual fund that has no commission or load in it in the first place. And, right. you know, there are some mutual funds out there, and, and it doesn't make them bad. You know, as long as you're getting what you expect, there's nothing wrong with a mutual fund that has a commission on it if it's meeting your expectations. But you need to know all those things in advance sure. before you start investing. We're going to take a quick break here. When we come back, we're really going to delve into this whole concept of finding a better mousetrap. You're watching The Savvy Investor. I'm Mike Kinnett, my guest, Matt Forster. We'll be right back. Join the host of the nationally syndicated TV series, The Savvy Investor, and best-selling author Michael Kinnett for this very important, life-changing workshop. Michael and his team of advisors from across the country have been helping families create and live the retirement they envision by carefully crafting a retirement income plan that can withstand any financial crisis. Michael will give you the tools you need to make sound investment choices and help you prepare for your golden years. At this workshop, you will learn more than just where to invest your money. Michael will also share tax strategies that can save you and your family thousands in tax dollars. You will learn important estate planning techniques that can help you avoid the high cost of a nursing home, as well as reduce or completely eliminate any estate tax. Now, you can join him in person for these very informative workshops. They could be the answer to creating a safe and secure retirement you deserve. Call 800-787-SAVVY to see if you qualify to attend one of these workshops with best-selling author Michael Kinnett, host of The Savvy Investor. Welcome back to The Savvy Investor. We're now going to take some time to answer questions from you, our viewers. Charlotte from Raleigh says she's been reading about unconstrained global allocation funds versus sector funds and index funds, and she's a bit confused. Mark, can you help her understand these things? Well, this is a very, very uh, uh, hot topic today uh, due to the fact that it's, it's widely believed that we're going towards a global economy. So let's take sector and index funds first. I think a great example of this is the 2000, 2001, 2002, and 2008 markets. If you were in a sector fund, let's say focused only on technology during the big tech bubble, uh, and you invested $1,000 or $2,000 or $10,000 into that fund, that fund manager would have no choice but to invest your money in technology stocks. Even though technology stocks at the time, as we know, were going down and down and down, that manager just had no choice because it's in the fund's objective. When it comes to index funds, it's good to look at 2008. So let's assume that you, you made an investment in one of the largest funds in the world, the Vanguard S&P 500 fund. Well, we all know that in 2008, all the way through March of 2009, the S&P 500 was in a free fall. And the, the reality is, if you put $50,000 or rolled your 401k that was $200,000 into that index fund, unfortunately, what you would have seen is a big loss in your money. 
An unconstrained global allocation fund is different. Basically, what we're doing here is we're hiring a manager. We're saying, hey, listen, here's our $50,000, our $10,000, our $100,000. You decide where in the world you want to invest. They can be in stocks. They can be in bonds. They can be in options. They can be long. They can be short. They can be invested in commodities. For instance, they can be invested in physical gold. We're relying on that manager's expertise to move our money around the world and try to make as much as possible in every given market scenario. Richard in Bethesda says that he and his advisors sat down to try to figure out how much it was going to cost to own his Vanguard mutual funds, and they called Vanguard, and the Vanguard customer service person couldn't tell him because he wasn't sure. And Richard wants to know, how can Vanguard charge me a fee if they don't even know how much it's going to cost? Mark, what are your thoughts? Well, this is that famous hidden fee in a mutual fund. So a mutual fund typically will have three fees. They'll have their operating cost, which is basically the fee that's paid to the managers of the fund. This fee is always reportable, and you can find it easily on various websites, including Morningstar. Um, the second fee is the 12B1 fee. This is typically going to be for that advertising. Fidelity is a great example of that with their commercials with the green, follow the green arrow. All that comes from the 12B1 fee. Your financial advisors are also paid out of that 12B1 fee. But that third fee, that hidden fee, is actually only reported one time per year, uh, and it's basically done in the annual report. And that fee is the transaction cost. That's the cost that the fund passes through to you as the shareholder for the acquire acquisition of the various stocks and bonds in that portfolio. These fees could be very low for very static portfolios that don't do a lot of trading, or they could be extremely high if you were, for instance, buying into a real estate fund. I've seen them as high as 5%. These fees are very important to understand, though, because those costs are passed through to you. A lot of people think when they look at their fund fee and they see 1% or half of 1% or 2.5% that that's all they pay. The reality is every year there's that additional cost added to whatever it is that your fund is currently charging you as their operating cost. It's also important to know if you have a lot of different funds uh, that they're not overlapping each other. For instance, if you had three different large cap value funds and all three of those funds happen to like Apple and they decided to buy Apple, each of those funds is going to charge you a transaction cost to make that purchase of Apple and each of those funds will also charge you when they sell Apple. As opposed to if you just had one fund that worked in that particular area, you would only pay one time to acquire Apple and one time to sell it. Thanks, Mark. Great questions, great answers. We're going to take a break now. When we come back, we're going to resume our conversation. Join the host of the nationally syndicated TV series, The Savvy Investor, and best-selling author Michael Kinnett for this very important, life-changing workshop. Michael and his team of advisors from across the country have been helping families create and live the retirement they envision by carefully crafting a retirement income plan that can withstand any financial crisis. Michael will give you the tools you need to make sound investment choices and help you prepare for your golden years. At this workshop, you will learn more than just where to invest your money. Michael will also share tax strategies that can save you and your family thousands in tax dollars. You will learn important estate planning techniques that can help you avoid the high cost of a nursing home, as well as reduce or completely eliminate any estate tax. Now, you can join him in person for these very informative workshops. They could be the answer to creating a safe and secure retirement you deserve. Call 800-787-SAVVY to see if you qualify to attend one of these workshops with best-selling author Michael Connett, host of The Savvy Investor. So some great questions on viewer mail, isn't it? Sure, great questions. So, so let's, let's focus now. You know, we, we spent the first half of the show talking about um, mutual funds and, and the pros and cons. Let's talk a little bit about what I've referred to as a better mousetrap, because that's really your, that's your expertise. You, you actually helped create uh, one of the first uh, actively managed exchange-traded funds for the, the consumer, for the public. Right, a portfolio of exchange-traded funds. We created the first So let, let's talk about what exactly is an exchange-traded fund. Just from the simple basics of what, a, what an exchange-traded fund is, let, let's tell our, our viewers what exactly those are. Okay, an exchange-traded fund is really a technological adaptation of a mutual fund. But the, the big issue is that it trades intraday. In other words, it is exchange-traded in the title. Now, that's a real gobbledygook. And if you think about what's happened, they've marketed 
ETFs as iShares or Spiders or PowerShares. You know, and Vanguard and Wisdom Tree also have a big set. Uh, and there's 36 now sponsors of exchange traded funds. But the big uh, innovation is they offer really low cost diversification and they trade intraday. So, but still, you, you still have basically a big basket of stocks and or bonds. Exactly. Based on an indice or not? Right. Most of them are based on an index. They're, they're based specifically on the S&P 500, uh, on the NASDAQ index, on some other stock or bond or commodity futures index or you know, international bond index. So they're based on an underlying index, and that's what gives them the low-cost feature. So, so we have an index, and, and because they're based, I mean, we have an ETF, a basket of stocks and bonds, and because it's based on an indice of some sort, um, we don't have to worry about a manager deciding what's the right stock or bond to buy. Exactly. Because, you know, what if it's in the S&P 500? Well, then it's in my index. Correct. Exactly. Okay. And so that cuts down on transaction costs inside the fund because you're not buying inside, in, exactly. inside it, right? Right. Which that's what ha helps reduce the overall fees. Right. You're not paying a manager. And let's talk about that intraday trading because I understand what that means and you understand what that means. But in reality, I mean, for, for you guys, what this really truly breaks down to is, and you think about this, if a plane hits a building at 9.30 in the morning, you get to sell your mutual fund three or four days later when the market opens up. And with the exchange-traded fund, you can dump out of the market just like that. And that's a significant difference, right? right. You, may not, you may not want to get sell, sell or get out of the fund, but at least you have that feature set. Right. Well, that's what intraday trading exactly. is about, is that you have the right to sell. You can sell at 9.30. Well, you can sell at 10, 11, 12, whenever you want to sell, so, which is fabulous. Right. When I was a young boy, my uncle told me that his Subaru could fly. Right. <laughs> it couldn't fly. So what do you do as a young boy? You come in and say, hey, can, where's the button? Can we fly this thing? Of course, it had always just been in the shop. He couldn't get it up to speed in time to take off. So anyway, we always ended up driving the Subaru on the ground. And that's sort of like what the intraday feature is for, for ETFs. If you trade intraday, that's great. But a lot of people may never need that feature. Still, it's a technological innovation over the mutual fund, which only trades at that end of day net asset value. Right, right. I'm, I'm not suggesting that you should be day trading. And that's not, that's not right. where I was going. Sure. But it does offer you that opportunity if that's what you want to do. Correct. Or if something happens or right. if you have a liquidity need. I mean, what we usually see is clients need cash or something right. that's come up, an emergency. So now, now let's talk about the whole idea of the tax implication because, you know, for us, it's, it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. And tax implications are part of that. Oh, very much. So. Yeah. Exchange traded funds much more tax efficient. Exchange traded funds are very tax efficient. In fact, you know, if you really look at the history of that, it's been way more tax efficient because they're matching a passive index than actively managed mutual funds. That difference has been big. Uh, and when you look at the only returns that you get to keep are the ones after you pay fees and pay taxes. Right. If you can prove your tax efficiency, it's a really good thing for most individual investors. So we were throwing out numbers from Wall Street from the Wall Street Journal saying, you know, one and a half to three percent. And you know, I recognize you can get cheaper funds, although I will tell you, you know, um, we've seen people come in from Vanguard and, um, and, and sat down with us and tried to figure out fees and we've explained to them how transaction costs work and stuff. And it's kind of interesting. We've actually got on the phone with the Vanguard itself to say, hey, explain to these clients the fees because they're sitting in front of me saying, I only pay a quarter of a point, which is a great, which is a very cheap right. fee. And Vanguard says, well, yeah, there are other fees. We just don't know how to calculate them and tell you over the phone. I mean, obviously, Vanguard knows how right. to calculate them. But where, where I want to go with this is let's talk about the fees of these things, because I, I mentioned one and a half to three percent. Where's the range for exchange traded funds? What's a reasonable expectation? Well, let's just look at large cap U.S. equities, right? That's uh, the biggest section, the biggest section of the exchange traded fund business. There's, you know, roughly 300 large cap U.S. ETFs in the market, you know, hundreds, uh, thousands of mutual funds that right. trade in the same space. On average, you know, the mutual funds in that space trains at about 1.5 percent and an expense ratio. That's before all the other fees. Right. U.S. ETFs in the same space traded about 25 basis points or one quarter of 1%. So literally you're talking about a fee that's one sixth. So it's really important for investors to understand that they have a vehicle where they can eliminate, you know, 75, 80% of the cost. They have to be willing to change from an actively managed mutual fund to a passively managed index matching exchange traded fund. And, and the actively managed funds charging those extra fees have proven over and over again that they don't actually beat the indice to begin with. Exactly. Now, it doesn't mean they don't, they never beat it. it. It does happen. Right. And there are funds that actually do it. But to some extent, you're chasing returns when you're looking for that manager who outperforms. You know, I love it when people come in with Morningstar, and it, it, it serves a purpose, but if you think about Morningstar telling you the, the best funds to be in, sure. all the four and five star funds in 1995, uh, 1999, 
by the time you got to 2000 to 2001, were off the charts and not even rated right. because they were horrible. So it kind of goes to that past performance. There's no indication of future result unless you look at Morningstar. You're talking about persistency. Right. You know, not only do to uh, actively manage mutual funds underperform, they tend to underperform consistently and over a long period of time. Right. You and know, 1%. So at, at higher fees. Right. So you're paying more for something that under, underperforms, you know, which really, and paying more taxes on it at the end of the day. And think about what 1% would mean over the course of 10 or 20 or 30 years. Yeah, it's it would huge. be a huge number. It's huge. Huge number. Yeah. Great conversation, great input. Um, last words of wisdom on ETFs? Anything else we should cover that we didn't touch on? Uh, yeah, the only other thing that I would mention is that ETFs have been very influential in the equity markets, and they're now going to become very influential in the bond markets as time marches on. There's a host of new ETFs based on bonds that people should really be considering here. And, and I've actually seen some, uh, some talk about ETFs in 401ks. Oh, that's coming too. That's, right. uh, that's going to be a big shift over the next couple of years. The technology for using ETFs inside of 401ks has really changed over the last, uh, last few years. And like you said, I mean, the whole idea of te technologically we're moving forward in all aspects of our life may be part of your investments that should be moving forward yeah, as well. There's been technological innovation in investment vehicles as well as everything else that we buy. Matt, great conversation. Thank you so much for Thanks, being on Mike. The Savvy Investor. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to give you your takeaways of the week. You're watching The Savvy Investor, and we'll be right back. Now keep in mind that just like any tool, there's the right tool for the right job and a wrong tool for the wrong job. We've just scratched the surface here, and you'll want to know more about how today's conversation might or might not fit your needs. Ask about fees, surrender charges, market risk, interest rate risks, how the guarantees work, liquidity, and much more. Remember, the right tool for the right job. Today we were joined by exchange traded fund expert Matt Forrester. And he laid out for us three really key takeaways for today. First and foremost, he explained to us the high cost of owning mutual funds that can be upwards towards 3%. You need to pay attention to that. The second thing he gave us was that exchange-traded funds can really offer us more flexibility and more control for you as an investor. And finally, that you can create a well-diversified portfolio using ETFs, and you can find some really nice, narrow, niche sectors that typically aren't available with mutual funds. I want to thank for joining us and giving us some wonderful insight into the world of both mutual funds and exchange-traded funds. If you'd like our free guide to understanding exchange-traded funds, call the number you see on the screen today. It's a step-by-step -step guide to help you make smart choices about your money. Give us a call, and we'll send out the guide at no cost to you. We'll see you, the savvy investor, next week.